So I think we can get started. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for joining us today and thanks for joining from all over the globe it would seem. We appreciate your time. Um, I'm Sasha Lowenthal, part of the marketing team here at Elliptic. And for those that didn't hear earlier, I am based in London. Um, I'm here to introduce our latest webinar on sanctions compliance and cryptocurrencies, how to ensure your business can comply. <clears throat> Um, this webinar is being hosted today by David Carla, Elliptic, Elliptic's uh, Director of Policy and Regulatory Affairs, and Abby Bryan, Elliptic Senior Customer Success Manager. So I will leave it to our hosts to introduce themselves properly, but I want to do a tiny bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, this session is being recorded, and we will send you the recording after the webinar, so don't worry if you miss anything or your internet drops. Um, but if you do have any questions throughout the session, please pop them in the Q&A box that you should be able to see in the bottom of your screen. And then we will endeavor to get to all of the questions throughout the session. Um, and yeah, and do feel free to lose the, um, to, sorry, lose to use the uh, chat function. I just got distracted by the, the good luck in the World Cup today. Hopefully it's coming home. Thank you. <laughs> um, so on that note, I will pass over to our host. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sasha. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today. I'm David Carlisle, the Director of Policy and Regulatory Affairs at Elliptic. A um, bit about myself. Um, prior to joining Elliptic uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, I'd worked at the US Department of the Treasury at the Office of Foreign Assets Control. So my own background is uh, in working uh, working on sanctions issues from, from the side of uh, the, the regulator, uh, OFAC itself. Um, a little while before I, I moved to the crypto industry, but uh, looking forward to sharing you know, some of the uh, insight about you know, sanctions compliance in this space and, and some of the trends and issues we're seeing at Elliptic. Thanks, David. Um, I will just do a brief introduction also. So my name is Abby Bryan. I'm a senior customer success manager at Elliptic. So what that essentially means is that I work very closely um, and support our enterprise and strategic customers, um, largely based in EMEA, but also working with their global teams. And it's really my role to ensure that um, customers are able to get the most value out of using the tools that Elliptic provides, but also get um, the most value out of that partnership with us as as well. So really great to uh, be speaking with you all today. So in terms of the uh, agenda, we're going to be covering a number of topics, starting off with um, understanding the risk uh, related to sanctions compliance. Um, then we'll be looking at emerging trends and typologies, followed by some information around the regulatory framework, and then we'll finish off with some um, sanction screening and compliance tips that you can apply to your own processes. Uh, yeah, just a word before we get into to some of the substance. Um, a lot of what we'll be talking about today is uh, reflective of some of the work we did in a recent report that we published last month uh, that you can see on the screen there. It's called uh, Sanctions Compliance in Cryptocurrencies Using Blockchain Analysis to Navigate the Minefield. Uh, provides really an overview of uh, you know, what the risks are in the space, you know, what some of the elements are of best practice that we see at Elliptic across the industry when it comes to, to dealing with sanctions compliance challenges. I uh, definitely recommend uh, you, you download it from our, our website if you've not had a chance to read it yet as it goes into to even more detail than we can today. Um, we will also, for, for those of you who have read it, read it we will be um, quizzing you a little bit, see how closely you read, and we'll see uh, if you uh, picked up on any uh, facts and figures from, from within the report. So, um, but, but please do download that uh, after today's session if you've not had a chance to, to read it yet. Um, Okay, so I think we're gonna we're gonna kick off with um, a poll. So uh, I will launch that to you, so you can um, have a look at some of those questions, and I'll just walk you through the questions whilst everybody's starting to respond to that poll. So the first question is, what activity do you think presents the biggest sanctions risk for crypto businesses? Um, and there's a number of different options there um, that you can choose from. The second question, which best describes your company? So we also have a few options here um, from we've implemented sanction screening systems to um, we have not yet implemented any screening systems or none of the above. Um, so have a look at those and see which applies to your business. And then finally, um, a polling question here on your company's compliance team. So what does the makeup of that team look like? 
whether it's sanctions compliance is easy for us all the way to sorry what are sanctions exactly um so take a few seconds we'll, we can i can see some of the uh answers that are coming in so i'll give it a couple of seconds and let everybody have a chance to answer that poll and then i'll share those results with you okay so we have quite a few people answering and we can stop it right now so i'll end that poll and share the results and see what results we can see so for the first question we can see actually quite a split um between uh facilitating ransomware payments trading involving privacy coins um and uh the next one is mining related transactions and activities in terms of what describes your companies um once again quite a healthy split there where the most common answer is that we've implemented a sanction screening system and then closely followed by none of the above or other so um really shows the range there and then the last one is just which talks about your company's compliance team the most common answer here is that sanctions compliance is often complex, but we only occasionally struggle with it in practice. So it seems like the, a lot of people here um, are already starting to think about those compliance processes and how it might apply to their business. Yeah, really great uh, to see those answers. Clear that people have been thinking about things a lot. So I'm looking forward to getting some uh, good engagement and questions throughout. So you know, please do share insights or, or questions in, in the chat as uh, Sasha suggested earlier. Uh, thanks for all, all for participating. Uh, so we'll, we'll jump in now to some of the, the, the substance of the session and wanted to start by providing a bit of an overview of you know the, the actual risk landscape and, and giving you you know an understanding of what you know the, the picture of sanctions evasions and sanction related risk looks like at least on a high level uh, in, in the crypto space uh, you know I think yeah, in first principles, it's always good to start by just understanding what the risk is, so you know what what types of challenges your business needs to be, uh, you know, uh, protecting against. Now, uh, I think it's helpful to just you know start briefly by thinking about you know what what is it about crypto that is um, attractive to sanctioned actors. Uh, I, you know, I, I think it's actually really not an exaggeration to say that at Elliptic, you know, among a lot of the research we do into illicit activity in crypto, um, the emergence of especially nation state and sanctioned nation state actors into the crypto space has really been, you know, one of, if need be not most significant uh, illicit finance trends we've we've observed over the past couple of years. Um, you know, and it's not to say that by any means that, saying that crypto is uh, the most widely used method for sanctions evasion. It's, I think, still, you know, relative to other methods of sanctions evasion, still uh, relatively small, but it's definitely growing, I think, in terms of its adoption by sanctioned actors. And, it, you know, I think that is because crypto uh, has some inherent features that are potentially useful to sanctioned actors. And we've listed some of them on the, them on the screen. So they're cross-border in nature. Uh, you know, you can send crypto uh, from anywhere to anywhere, really, um, which is incredibly useful if you are an isolated nation state that needs access to, uh, or, or whose access to the international financial system has been curtailed. Uh, crypto provides a potential alternative to that. Uh, obviously, with different crypto assets, there are varying degrees of anonymity or pseudonymity. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that today and some of the differences between how we see maybe uh, privacy coins beginning to be adopted by, by certain sanctioned actors versus um, you know, what, what some of the capabilities are when it comes to being able to trace the activity of, um, uh, of sanctioned actors in, in much more uh, uh, traceable and, and ultimately pseudonymous cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin that aren't fully anonymous. Um, but, but you know, the, the fact that identities aren't attached to payments in crypto is, you know, a, an attractive feature to sanctioned actors who, uh, you know, maybe want to make it harder for, for their activity to be detected, you know, where they might otherwise be subject to sanction screening through the banking system. Um, I, I think another really big factor that's driving some of this adoption are gaps in regulatory enforcement and the application of KYC uh, across certain crypto platforms globally. Um, you know, I think there's certainly an increasing 
and much more aggressive regulatory framework and perimeter across much of the world at the moment, and especially in major financial centers. But there do remain a lot of countries in the world where it is possible to access a crypto exchange with no KYC and where regulation on crypto maybe hasn't been adopted yet. Uh, so where criminals can access exchanges with, with really no barrier to entry at all. Uh, that's very, very useful if you're a sanctioned actor who doesn't want to be caught in sanction screening. Um, but I think, you know, one of the really big factors, maybe maybe the biggest one, is the permissionless or censorship resistant nature of crypto assets. So this is the notion that being a decentralized uh, set of technologies, you can't stop somebody from creating a wallet or accessing a wallet. Uh, you can't reverse their transactions. Uh, you might be able to seize funds, but you can't uh, you know, there's no single central party who can reverse transactions. Uh, that again is very, very useful if you are somebody who's subject to restrictions through other uh, components of the financial sector. And so, um, you know, I think there are some inherent factors that make crypto useful for sanctions evasion purpose. But as we'll see, there there are a lot of strategies that can be deployed to to uh, you know mitigate against some of that risk. But we'll look a little bit now what the the risk actually looks like and how it's it's manifesting. Now, I think, uh, you know, among sanctioned actors, really the, the most prolific um, when it comes to the use of crypto has been North Korea. Um, North Korea has a, quite a sophisticated cyber criminal apparatus um, that, you know, is involved on launching widespread attacks across the financial sector generally. And it's directed a lot of this at the cryptocurrency uh, sector and infrastructure as well. Um, by most credible estimates, and I mean, we agree with this at Elliptic, uh, North Korea appears to have amassed you know, probably more than about a billion dollars worth of cryptocurrency to date. Um, now, most of that has been acquired through uh, hacks of large crypto exchanges, um, especially those based in Asia. Um, though North Korea is also engaged in really any imaginable type of cyber crime, uh, things like ransomware, uh, fraud, uh, crypto jacking, uh, really you name it. But uh, the, the primary methods through which they seem to be hauling in a lot of crypto is, is through hacking exchanges. And they're also starting to demonstrate, I think, in North Korea, uh, a very sophisticated ability to uh, not just uh, hack crypto exchanges and launch cybercrime attacks that involve uh, uh, the cryptocurrency sector and that enable them to get their hands on crypto, um, but they're also showing sophistication in their ability to launder crypto uh, once, they, once they do get their hands on it. Um, here on the screen, you can see some information that was taken from a... Uh, uh, Department of Justice uh, action last year um, in March of 2020 uh, that involved uh, charges that were brought against two Chinese nationals who were acting as money launderers for the North Korean uh, linked cybercrime group, the Lazarus Group. Uh, and the way these schemes worked is the Lazarus Group would uh, send uh, you know, malware, uh, you know, phishing emails to exchanges in Asia. In this particular case, I think it was to an exchange in Hong Kong. Uh, they would get uh, access to that exchange's uh, wallets, uh, empty them. Um, in one particular case, the, the Lazarus Group managed to steal about $250 million worth of cryptocurrency from a single exchange. Uh, then you can see they laundered that uh, those funds through numerous other exchanges, most of which were uh, primarily exchanges where there was little or no KYC applied. So you know th these groups clearly realized that there were vulnerable exchanges out there where they could launder these stolen funds. Um, and then these two Chinese money launderers uh, would, would take those funds uh, in crypto, convert them into fiat currency, and then proceed to launder them through the banking sector. Uh, so you can see these are quite intricate typologies that fuse uh, new techniques for a you know, sanctioned actor to get their hands on crypto, uh, launder the crypto, and then you know, combine that with more uh, sort of traditional money laundering techniques, things like you can see on the screen there, they, they would convert the funds to fiat currency and buy Apple iTunes gift cards, for example. Uh, a little later in the session, we'll show you a video of how some of this activity actually took place. And it, you, you can see that uh, it really is quite complex. So, I mean, in North Korea, you have a, a, a very um, sophisticated cyber criminal actor uh, who's able to access substantial amounts of cryptocurrency uh, and launder them and, and turn those funds into fiat currency that they could potentially use for other purposes, you know, such as prol proliferation financing. Uh, another uh, nation state actor subject to sanctions who have been uh, quite active in the crypto space has been Venezuela. 
Uh, you may remember a few years ago, uh, Venezuela announced the launch of its own cryptocurrency, uh, the Petro. So rather than you know, going the route of North Korea and taking to cybercrime, uh, Venezuela just said, you know, we're going to launch our own coin you know, with the idea that having a, you know, a blockchain based crypto asset of their own that they issued, that could be used, be, used to be, be used to facilitate payments uh, outside and, and uh, around and enable them to circumvent um, the, the US financial system and the restrictions that they face there. Um, now, Venezuela appears to have essentially launched the Petro on, on their own blockchain that created. And there's a lot of question and debate about whether uh, it's really been especially effective or meaningful in allowing them to, to truly skirt sanctions. Uh, they have approved a number of domestic exchanges to enable Petro trading. And you can see here on the screen, they've actually launched a pet, it's called a Petro app, where you can swap Petros for Bitcoins and Litecoins. Um, you know, based upon the analysis we do at Elliptic, we are able to see, you know, other crypto assets like Bitcoin going in and out of these services. So they're currently clearly being used. Uh, you know, whether Venezuela is having a lot of success from a, a sanctions invasion perspective like North Korea is, is, is you know, hard to tell. Um, but, but clearly they are trying and innovating ways to use the technology to try to skirt some of the restrictions they face, uh, you know, from the U.S. primarily. Now, in, in addition to launching their own crypto, Venezuela has also uh, looked to Bitcoin mining as a potential source of revenue. Uh, now, as a you know, energy rich country, uh, Venezuela has, has a great infrastructure that can enable them to host you know, what is a very energy intense uh, process of Bitcoin mining. Uh, you know, they and and uh, governments can you know they can uh, kind of exploit the uh, the underlying mining activity in a couple of ways. So you know, first they can run licensing regimes whereby they can effectively tax uh, you know companies or uh, mining entities that want to operate in the country. But then obviously they can collect a portion of the mining rewards and proceeds that come from actually undertaking the mining itself. Uh, and here in this case, you can see uh, on the screen. Uh, images of Venezuelan military officials assembling uh, Bitcoin mining equipment. So clearly, they're they're looking to a number of ways to to leverage the technology as a way of generating revenue, uh, you know, potentially accessing payments outside of of the mainstream financial sector. Uh, now, um, when it comes to Bitcoin mining, um, it, we don't really have a great sense at the moment, at least, of of how significant Venezuela's mining operations have been. Um, but a country that appears to have been actually uh, potentially substantially successful in terms of utilizing uh, Bitcoin mining as a way of evading sanctions is uh, Iran. Now, uh, about a year and a half, almost two years ago, uh, the Iranian government uh, set out a licensing scheme for uh, Bitcoin and crypto mining. And basically, they propose that if you if you want to mine Bitcoin in Iran, uh, you need to come and get a license from us. Uh, you can only do it if you've been pre-approved, uh, but, but we're going to create a framework to do that. So, you know, they, they collect licensing fees from those who engage in mining, and they also require that um, the proceeds be turned over to the central bank of Iran, which can then use some of the underlying Bitcoin effectively to potentially to do things like, you know, facilitate, uh, you know, again, payments outside the international financial system. Now, you can see here on the screen some examples of, of uh, you know, mining equipment that's actually in a mosque in Iran. Um, but one of the ways uh, you know, Iran's looked to profit from mining activity is by hosting companies from abroad. So you can see a, a news article there on the screen where a, a large Chinese mining pool uh, named Lubian has set up a Bitcoin mining, mining farm in Iran. So uh, Iran's also using you know, the, the fact that they are energy rich, that they, they are an uh, you know, effective location for engaging in mining activity to attract you know, foreign investment from, from places like China as well. Um, so you know, mining serves a couple of functions for them in terms of enabling them to attract investment, uh, but also potentially to generate revenue that they can use as a, as a form of sanctions evasion. Now, um, another thing it allows them to do is to make use of some of their domestic energy resources that um, they cannot export um, because of international sanctions. So Iran will have you know, surplus uh, oil and gas sitting around because they're not able to effectively uh, export it as well as they would without certain international and primarily at this stage US restrictions in place. Um, but utilizing that energy to, to mine Bitcoin uh, effectively allows them to, you know, quote unquote, export uh, their, their energy resources and generate revenue with it. 
So um, on that note, we're going to run a little quiz, um, which I will turn over to Abby. We're going to test your knowledge about Iran's Bitcoin mining activity. Yes, we are. So I will launch that now and we'll read it out for everybody. So according to Elliptic's estimates, what percentage of all Bitcoin mining takes place in Iran? Less than 1%, between 4 to 5%, between 5 to 10%, or greater than 10%. So I'll give everybody a few minutes just to uh, get those answers in. And then we can see who's read our sanctions report. Okay, we have quite a few answers coming in now. So we'll give it a couple more seconds. Okay, so Let's end that and see what everyone shared. So the, the overall sort of uh, consensus and actually the correct answer is that um, it is between four to five percent of all Bitcoin mining actually does take place in Iran, which is clearly quite substantial. And um, so good, uh, good job for the 45 percent of people uh, who answered that. Yeah, and you can see there on the screen a chart we put together that shows that uh, really since they launched this domestic licensing framework, uh, Iran's proportion of uh, Bitcoin mining activity as a percentage of the whole uh, has grown. So uh, really what that means is effectively, um, you know, uh, about four to five out of every 100 Bitcoin transactions that are processed are, are effectively mined in Iran. Um, so, you know, there, there is a substantial risk that, you know, as a business, when you process a Bitcoin transaction or as an individual, when you engage in a Bitcoin transaction, uh, that, that you could interact with an Iranian miner. Uh, now, there are a number of techniques for, uh, you know, either avoiding having transactions sent to those, uh, to those miners or um, similarly for screening payments to see if you might be in receipt of funds from an Iranian miner, for example. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the technical ways you can, you can do that later in the session. Uh, but you know, a good illustration of the fact that um, a country like Iran is, is engaging in a very meaningful level of activity involving, involving Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, I think that's a, you know, obviously a very brief overview of some of the, the trends we're seeing in terms of how nation state actors are um, uh, you know, attempting to utilize crypto when it comes to uh, enabling sanctions evasion. Uh, but there are a few more recent um, and, and quite new emerging trends and typologies that we're observing. So I wanted to mention those briefly as well. I think it, it helps to further illustrate kind of the nature of the, the threat landscape and the risks that exist. So uh, one technique that we're seeing um, sanctioned actors used for evasion purposes is uh, the use of privacy wallets. Now, privacy wallets function a bit like Bitcoin mixers. Uh, you, you may be aware of the concept of Bitcoin mixers, uh, essentially services that take in Bitcoin from lots of different users, uh, effectively jumble them up to hide the original source of funds or their destination and make it harder to know, you know whether funds say came from an illicit source or from a sanctioned entity. Uh, privacy wallets do something fairly similar, except unlike mixers, which are uh, centralized services primarily, uh, privacy wallets are just software apps that have a sort of inbuilt and more decentralized mixing capability. And so they're, they're quite effective for, for laundering Bitcoin and helping to obfuscate the flow of Bitcoin funds. And as you can see there, um, last year, based on some analysis we did, we, we determined that about 13% of all illicit Bitcoin are now laundered through privacy wallets like Wasabi Wallet that you can see there on the screen. So these are an increasingly popular method of, of laundering for criminals generally uh, in, in the crypto space. Uh, but we are seeing sanctioned actors uh, make use of privacy wallets as well. Now, what you can see here on the screen is uh, some, an image uh, related to an Iranian uh, mining pool called uh, iMiner, or it's called Didino in Farsi. 
Um, there's an image there of its, its website on the screen where it invites you to come you know, in, invest uh, with them. And uh, on the right, you can see uh, an image from Elliptic Software where we look at some funds flows going from uh, addresses belonging to Dedino, the mining entity, to various other actors in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And we can see Dedino tr transacting with uh, a couple of uh, Bitcoin exchanges in Iran called Xcoino and Novatex. Uh, you could also see them uh, transacting with well, at least one global Bitcoin exchange and a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, you know, which represents the, the risk that, say, exchanges face from potentially interacting with these entities. But you can also see some of the funds going to a Wasabi wallet, so one of these privacy wallets. So presumably what this mining pool is, is trying to do is to pass some of its Bitcoin through a privacy wallet, which again will have that mixing function so that once funds were sent on from that Wasabi wallet, say a Bitcoin exchange in the US or Europe, would not know that they originally came from a, a, an Iranian entity. So a, a good example of how we can see um, some of these sanctioned entities or sa entities in sanctioned jurisdictions uh, using these obfuscating techniques to try to, to uh, evade sanctions. Um, we're also seeing some indication that uh, sanctioned actors are looking increasingly to uh, privacy coins uh, as a way of obfuscating their activity. Uh, now, privacy coins, when we talk about those, uh, we're referring to coins like uh, Monero, Zcash, uh, Dash, uh, those coins which don't have the same level of traceability that Bitcoin and other very transparent crypto assets have. Um, now, what you can see here on the screen are two uh, entries from the OFAC sanctions list, uh, which will We'll talk a little bit more in, in a few minutes about uh, the, the OFAC sanctions listing process. Uh, but you can see the entries here for two Russian cyber criminals who OFAC sanctioned last September. Uh, and I've circled in red on their entries on the SDN list um, various addresses that OFAC identified these criminals used. And you can see that those addresses are for XMR, which is Monero, uh, really probably the, the most highly anonymized of. of popular privacy coins, uh, but also ZC, which is Zcash, a Dash, again, which is another privacy coin. So we are finding that these sanctioned actors, uh, and we, we are finding this too as well, you know, potentially with North Korea via cybercrime, that they are looking to these privacy enhanced technologies, uh, potentially as a way to, to evade sanctions as well. Um, now, lastly, uh, another, uh, I'd say, very early emerging trend, but, but something we are starting to see um, is the potential use of decentralized finance or DeFi platforms for sanctions evasion purposes. Uh, now with DeFi platforms, you know what we're referring to are essentially smart contract-based contract platforms that allow users to engage in uh, you know, exchange activity, uh, lending, and other services without requiring a single central intermediary. Uh, you may be aware of popular uh, you know, decentralized exchanges or DEXs like Uniswap, for example. Um, there's been a lot of concern among regulators you know, over the past couple of years, and this is accelerating at the moment at the level of the, the Financial Action Task Force, uh, that DeFi platforms could be very vulnerable to criminal or you know, sanctioned related activity, because typically speaking, they've not been regulated to date, and they don't generally require KYC of users. Um, so, you know, there, there's been a lot of speculation that criminals and sanctioned actors may want to use them. Now, over the past few years, we've really not seen a lot of, act, uh, of evidence of that activity. But last year, we saw what was quite a significant case of sanctions evasion involving DEXs or decentralized exchanges. And that involved the hack of a uh, crypto exchange in Singapore called KuCoin. Uh, so uh, KuCoin was the subject of a hack by cyber criminals. Uh, it's since been attributed to North Korea's Lazarus Group by the, the United Nations. Uh, so North Korean criminals managed to steal about $280 million worth of crypto from the KuCoin exchange. Uh, but once they had their hands on all that crypto, they, they needed to launder it. So uh, they, they had quite a few tokens that were you know, Ethereum-based tokens. And they looked to DEXs or decentralized exchanges to, to launder those funds. 
Uh, and what you can see there on the other side of the screen is analysis we did at Elliptic that looked at you know, what were the destination DEXs or decentralized exchanges where these cyber criminals attempted to, to launder those funds. Uh, you can see there that a substantial proportion of the funds, over 10 million, were sent by a Uniswap DEX. Uh, you know, a number of other tokens that these criminals had stolen uh, went to, to several other DEXs as well. So clearly what we're seeing here is at least an initial case or indication you know, that a sophisticated cyber criminal actor like North Korea that's subject to sanctions uh, you know, has the capability to exploit DeFi platforms to engage in sanctions evasion. Uh, again, this is really the, the first such instance we've, uh, we've attributed to a, to a sanctioned actor, but it's definitely going to be one to watch to see if, if um, sanctioned actors continue to try to use DeFi platforms and technology, and it's certainly something I think regulators will be, be looking closely at as well. Um, so, you know, having just talked a little bit about what, you know, the, the threat landscape looks like and what some of the patterns of activity are, um, I wanted to just talk briefly about the, the regulatory framework and uh, for sanctions in crypto and what it entails. Now, I think um, you know, most of you on the call, maybe all of you will be very familiar with, with the name of OFAC or, or the Office of Foreign Assets Control at the US Department of the Treasury, uh, again, where, where I worked once upon a time. Uh, you know, OFAC is responsible for, for administering uh, US sanctions. And um, OFAC really began to turn its attention to sanctions issues uh, back in March of 2018. Now, um, what, one of the first, actions that prompted this was an executive order that prohibited uh, U.S. persons from having involvement or dealings with uh, Venezuelan government-backed digital currencies, so really the, the Petro, the direct response to the Petro. Uh, but, but what OFAC also did that month was issued for the first time a specific uh, FAQs on digital currency to, to help clarify for, for uh, U.S. persons and the private sector what its expectations are when it comes to sanctions compliance. And really what OFAC said, I mean, to, to paraphrase, but really what they said at that time is really all of the sanctions requirements that we've been administering for years, you know, under various sanctions programs involving Iran, North Korea, uh, narcotics traffickers, you know, really all of those, they apply where you're using crypto assets. So it doesn't matter if you're transacting in crypto assets rather than fiat currency, the same sanctions requirements apply. So really they made it clear that you know, if you are dealing in crypto, you need to follow the exact same sanctions rules that you would if you were dealing in, in dollars or any other in crypto. And OFAC will, will you know, hold you to account you know, regardless of what the underlying uh, asset is that you use. Now. I think where things really began to get more interesting from uh, you know, the perspective of how OFAC was, was administering the sanctions uh, came in November of 2018. And that was the first time that OFAC undertook a sanctions action where it listed uh, Bitcoin or crypto addresses belonging to sanctioned persons. Uh, and you can see in that case, uh, OFAC designated um, a couple of Iranian individuals um, who were involved in laundering the proceeds of uh, ransomware attacks. And you can see their, uh, their entries or listings from the, the OFAC uh, SDN list here on the screen. So these come right from the sanctions list itself that OFAC administers. And you can see again, we've, we've circled them in red, um, but for each of these uh, individuals in Iran, uh, these, these money launderers, uh, OFAC listed a couple of, of Bitcoin addresses. And this becomes really incredibly important information uh, for you know, the private sector and for those who need to comply with sanctions, because it really becomes the first clue that you know, here's a specific Bitcoin address that belongs to a sanctioned individual I'm prohibited from dealing with. You know, and we'll talk a little bit about you know, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, once OFAC puts that type of information out there, um, companies like Elliptic we can use that information to assist you know, our customers in doing a 
much more robust sanction screening to, and that enables them to identify addresses that aren't just on the OFAC list, but also other addresses that these individuals may control. So a very important, I think, kind of landmark action for OFAC. Now, um, since then, OFAC has been very busy. Uh, I won't through, run through each of these, but you can see that since that time, they've undertaken uh, five additional sanctions actions involving um, you know, the two Chinese money launderers for the Lazarus Group I talked about before, uh, narcotics traffickers, uh, various individuals involved in Russian uh, linked cybercrime. And they've listed now dozens of crypto addresses belonging to these, these sanctioned individuals and entities. And what that means, again, is that, you know, the private sector has a lot more information that it can use now to enable it to screen for what are effectively blacklisted addresses and addresses associated with blacklisted people. And we'll, again, we'll talk in a few minutes about how you actually undertake that process of screening in the crypto space. But it goes without saying, I think, you know, OFAC is, is definitely um, made its presence known in the crypto space at this point, you know, through these various listing actions. And I think we'll see them list uh, many more crypto addresses over time. Uh, so actually, on that note, uh, we've got a, another brief quiz for you. Um, so I'll turn it over to Abby, who's going to um, uh, pose the quiz question to you. Yeah, so I'm going to launch that now. And so you should be able to see that pop up. And essentially, the question is, what is the total value of crypto that has passed through OFAC listed crypto addresses? Is it $7.5 million, $75 million, $175 million or $275 million. And so we'll give that a few seconds for everybody to have the opportunity to answer. I see lots of answers rushing in now. So just over half of you have answered. So get those answers in. Okay, so I will end that. And as we can um, see here, the majority of people answered $275 million. And actually, um, the answer is $175 million uh, US dollars and um, has passed through OFAC listed crypto addresses. So as you can see, a significant uh, value there. Yeah, and you can see here on the screen, I've uh, shared a chart that shows the uh, the amount of crypto going through those OFAC listed wallets. Uh, you can see it's about $150 million worth of Bitcoin, uh, about $50 million worth of Ether, then some negligible amounts of some other um, uh, other crypto assets, but I need this to say, you know, these are these are quite active addresses. Um, you know, OFAC is clearly hitting some some very prolific targets when it comes to uh, who they're putting on their list. And again, I, I think we'll only see them go um, out, you know, list more addresses um, over time. Uh, now, briefly, before we just turn to some of the the kind of compliance techniques for for dealing with these measures. Um, just wanted to mention a couple other things. So uh, OFAC uh, in October of last year, uh, you can see there on the screen, uh, issued an advisory on potential sanctions risks for facilitating ransomware payments. Uh, this is something that I think has uh, become even more relevant recently with the explosion we're seeing in, in ransomware activity. Now, what based OFAC said really in, in that uh, advisory is that, you know, if you make a ransomware payment and it goes to a sanctioned entity or individual or to someone in a sanctioned jurisdiction, it's a violation of sanctions. And we're not going to make an exemption for the fact that, you know, someone was victimized by ransomware. So that really means that, you know, when anyone makes a ransomware payment, they need to be very, very alert to the sanctions risks that are involved, especially given that countries like North Korea, uh, you know, participants, uh, individuals in Iran uh, have been involved in, in some prolific ransomware campaigns. Um, we're also seeing OFAC start to uh, get, you know, get involved in enforcement in this space as well. Um, and uh, in December of last year, and again in February of, of uh, this year, we saw OFAC issue its first two enforcement actions uh, involving 
uh, crypto businesses. You, you can see there on the screen, one involving uh, BitGo and another involving BitPay. And, and both of those were cases where uh, the businesses had uh, information available to them that they, you know, mostly via IP addresses that people were using their platforms from sanctioned jurisdictions, uh, but they, they failed to prohibit the activity. Now, uh, you can see in both of those cases, the fines were, were relatively small uh, and, and the actually underlying violations were, were fairly small. Um, I, you know, I think these were fairly open and shut cases for OFAC, but I think it's a sign of, of things to come. And I think we will only see OFAC get much more engaged in this space from an enforcement perspective, uh, and, and we'll see much, much larger fines with, with time. Um, I th just a very brief note um, here before we turn to some of the compliance solutions. Um, you know, it's just to say that while, while OFAC, I think, has been the most kind of prolific uh, you know, sanctions authority in this space, um, it is important to keep in mind that you may have other sanctions requirements based upon where, say, your company operates. Uh, and, and, you know, while most uh, really other, other sanctions authorities other than OFAC really have not, for the most part, issued specific guidance on crypto, uh, you still need to make sure that, you know, if you're processing crypto transactions, they don't go on to uh, you know, and don't aren't to the benefit of uh, individuals and entities that are on other sanctions lists in addition to OFAC. Now, that may include the UN list or the EU's list, uh, the HM Treasury list, if you're based in or have operations in the UK. Uh, but the important thing to keep in mind is, you know, you really need the, the capability to ensure that you're screening payments and transactions in crypto, you know, against not just the OFAC list, but potentially other lists. So I, I think that's actually a good segue into you know, our, our final section, which is in thinking about you know, what are some of the compliance solutions that you can leverage to, to actually ensure you're meeting those requirements. And I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Abby there. Thank you so much. And that is a, a really good segue. And um, as I'm sure everyone would uh, expect, I spend a lot of time talking to the clients that I work with about sanctions compliance and how they can ensure that they are um, aware of any exposure that they may possibly have and how they can avoid it. And um, so can we, if we go on to the next uh, slide. Um, so at Elliptic, um, we sort of empower uh, businesses to manage their exposure to sanctioned actors. Um, and we do this by providing a number of solutions um, that make using those blockchain insights um, available to those businesses to help them prevent dealing with sanctioned actors. So in the course of the next few slides, I'm going to um, touch on um, a few of these, but essentially the sort of essential component of a blockchain anal um, using blockchain analytics for um, a compliance team should include um, and that pre-transaction screening, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more depth in a moment. And um, the transaction monitoring, so identifying the ultimate source um, of desti or destination of funds and um, that you are um, that you have exposure to or that you're engaging with. Having a, a complex investigations um, system in place so that you can identify and scrutinize any cases where um, there could be uh, sanctions exposure. And then finally, looking a little bit um, at that that VASP due diligence. So not just looking at your own um, exposure to sanctions, uh, but also to the, your counterparties. So if we move to the next slide. Now, the sort of the most common thing that I spend uh, time talking with customers about is how they can use the configuration, their configuration ability in Elliptic to configure their risk rules to ensure that they have all of the information needed um, when they are required to make quick and effective decisions, especially in relation to, um, to sanctions. Now, using the uh, elliptic configurable risk rules, you can ensure um, that when you screen wallets in elliptic lens or transactions in elliptic navigator, that you're um, able to view a risk score should you have any exposure to sanctioned entities or high risk countries. So on the screen, you can see there um, a, a sort of screenshot of the way that our risk triggers, our risk rules are configured, where you're able to set specific categories, whether that would include um, you know, specific sanctioned um, uh, sanctioned entities. Also, your the, those high risk countries there. So we can see Iran and North Korea. If you can move on to the next slide. Now, um, 
Elliptic's data set contains crypto addresses belonging to individuals and entities on global sanctions lists, as well as information about exchanges and other entities using crypto in high risk jurisdictions. So you can see there we have um, data covering sort of specific OFAC listed addresses, which David covered um, previously, where we're able to take the addresses shared by OFAC directly and we're able to add that into our data set. So when you screen transactions or addresses, and if you have exposure to any of those addresses that are uh, blacklisted, you will be able to um, receive a risk score and sort of make a decision or action based on that information. But also, as you saw on the previous slide, our risk triggers enable you to add a sanction status trigger. Now, what this does is it enables you to screen um, all of your analyses against sank of sorry, all of your analyses against sanctioned entities that cover um, a number of sanctions lists, obviously including that OFAC SDN list, but also some of the lists that um, David mentioned in a, a few slides ago, including uh, the UK, the EU, Japan, Canada, Australia, um, and the UN as well. Now, in addition to um, being able to screen up against those specific lists um, by being able to utilize the configuration of those risk rules, you can also cover yourself um, uh, and assign risk scores to wallets and transactions associated with those sanctioned countries. So countries including you know, some of the ones that David mentioned, so North Korea, Iran and Venezuela, as well as other countries that are um, sanctioned and high risk. And what this will do is enable you to ensure that you have full visibility should you have any exposure to those types of entities. Next uh, slide, please. Now, a huge part um, of any um, sanctions compliance program will include um, a pre-screening uh, process. Um, so on the slide here, you can see Exchange A, uh, so uh, the face of which is David, so um, David's Exchange. And then if you sort of click through David, um, and then you see a, a transaction to um, an address here. Now, through the use of pre-screening, um, of pre-screening that transaction, so through the use of address screening, you're able to screen wallets using our tools, which will allow you to see both the source and the destination of funds for that specific wallet, which enables you to see any exposure to sanction risk before the funds actually move. So the benefit clearly is that you're able to pre-screen before any funds have moved, avoiding sort of interacting with any sanctioned actors um, or um, with wallets that have exposure to sanctioned entities or actors. So you can see in this case, it avoids that um, transaction going ahead and gives you information early enough that you're able to make those important and quick decisions and um, to avoid that type of um, interaction. Now, on top of your transaction um, monitoring and your pre-screening, uh, pre um, it's also incredibly important that you'll, you have in place an investigation strategy that allows you to look in depth at customer activity and scrutinize it um, in detail. So if we just press, press play on this video, um, and I'll walk you through what you're seeing. Oops. There we go. So what you can see on the screen here is um, a recording of uh, an investigation being created around the theft that David was talking about previously related to the Lazarus group. Now, David mentioned before how complex um, the sort of the um, techniques that this criminal organization used in order to launder those funds. And as you can see here, when creating um, this investigation, you really get an idea of the scope and the methods used um, to launder those funds um, from that original theft. Now, um, it's in incredibly important in sanctions related cases, especially where there's maybe indirect or seemingly remote connections between customers and sanctioned parties, and um, to be able to fully uh, identify all exposure to those entities, especially um, in the case of sanctions, where even a remote um, exposure would require you to, to um, do some reporting um, or sort of take action immediately. So it's really important to have that sort of investigation process in place. 
Now, in terms of a well-designed investigation strategy, obviously we would suggest that um, all of your staff are skilled in conducting these types of cryptocurrency investigations. Um, investigations can be incredibly complex, they can take a lot of time, and they can be quite objective. So it's really important that your, that your staff are upskilled. Um, and obviously this is something that we spend a lot of time doing with our customers here at Elliptic. Also, it's incredibly important that you have documented investigation processes and record keeping policies in place so that you can keep a track of any cases that have sanctioned um, elements, sanctions elements to them, as well as leveraging network analysis and case management tools effectively and um, using tools like Elliptic alongside um, additional sort of case management tools to ensure um, that you're able to keep track of any alerts or any information. And then finally, having an internal escalation process for raising those alerts when you identify sort of exposure to sanctioned entities. The next slide. The, the last thing that I wanted to comment on and something that I also talked to some of my customers about is the concept of um, sort of VASP due diligence. Now, especially for financial institutions, it might be that they don't have direct exposure to crypto themselves. And um, however, it is really important that they have visibility on the indirect exposure to risk, especially in relation to sanctions. So it might be that as a, you're a financial institution and that you don't handle crypto, but you bank um, services or businesses that um, handle crypto themselves. And as you can see in the in the slide here, where we have uh, our bank on the left hand side interacting with that crypto exchange, but not having visibility over the risk associated and um, to sort of sanctioned entities or, or countries and um, because they don't have direct exposure themselves. Now, if we just move to the next slide. Now, using a tool like Elliptic's vast due diligence tool um, called Discovery, FIs are able to get visibility on the risk profile of their vast counterparties. So this includes information. You can see sort of a, um, a brief uh, demo recording of what that might look like. But this includes information in relation to um, those counterparties' interaction with sanctioned entities. So it allows them to have that visibility even if the exposure isn't direct between themselves. But, you know, ultimately, they will need to have that visibility and um, even indirect and be able to report should they have exposure to sanctioned entities or uh, countries. Thanks, Abby. Um, so, yeah, really just, you know, to summarize and then we'll, we'll have time for a, a couple of questions. Um, you know, really, we see sanctioned actors are, are working to acquire crypto you know, to evade sanctions using you know, various methods such as cybercrime, you know, launching their own tokens and mining. Uh, we are seeing some emerging areas of risk like privacy wallets, privacy coins, and DeFi platforms. Um, as Abby mentioned, you should really be conducting sanction screening on uh, wallets pre-transaction, but, but it's also important you know, to identify and have capabilities to identify things like post-transaction sanctioned exposure through investigations uh, or to be able to conduct vast due diligence to identify again sort of downstream uh, sanctions risks. Uh, also, you know, ensure you can comply with not just OFAC sanctions, uh, but, you know, those in any jurisdiction where you operate, where they have specific sanctions requirements, and, you know, that, that really means ensuring that you have systems that are supported by, by robust data sources and that enable, you know, configurable monitoring as, as Abby talked about. Um, so with that, you know, we've got some time for questions. I'm happy to, to field some. Uh, I will just take one that I saw that came up in the chat um, on that last point. So um, someone asked a question, does Elliptic, um, does Elliptic screen other sanctions lists like uh, the EU for, for sanctioned addresses or individuals? So uh, yeah, the, the answer is yes. Um, so I think as Abby mentioned, um, our, our screening solutions able, uh, you know, screen not just against the OFAC list, but also, uh, you know, for, for entities that are on uh, the EU, UN, uh, Australia, um, Canada, and a number of other uh, widely utilized um, uh, sanctions lists. So that, that ability to screen against multiple lists is, is there. Um, I'm seeing I'm seeing a question pop up that I can probably answer um, is relating to does our screening tools allow 
uh, feature a sandbox environment where you can test rules um, and settings? Um, and the answer is yes. And this is something that we um, really, you know, I work with customers every day and this is, we really encourage this element of testing um, and um, refining when it comes to things like your, your risk rule configuration um, and the uh, configurations that you have in place. So that, so yes is the answer to that. Um, I was just going to say thanks, um, <clears throat> David and Abby. You're doing my job there for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's quite a few quite specific questions in here. I don't know whether we might take some of those offline because you'll probably need quite a lengthy answer that might not be relevant for everyone in the webinar. But we've just got a question coming now, which is um, around the ease of creating new addresses and how often um, the sanction list is updated. Yeah, it's it's a great question. I think um, th there's no doubt that the ability to create new addresses poses a real challenge to um, you know, sanctions enforcement generally, but also sanctions compliance. Um, so, you know, while OFAC is able to put sanctions addresses on their on their sanctions list, you know, a, a sanctioned actor can go and just create new addresses. Now, there are some ways for us to try to mitigate against those risks. So, um, you know, using some of the data analytic techniques we apply, um, when OFAC puts new addresses on the list, uh, we can frequently identify many more addresses that those same entities control, but that are not included on the list. So, for example, OFAC might put, uh, you know, a, an individual on the list and list three or four of those Bitcoin, uh, their Bitcoin addresses. And we, in some cases, have been able to, to identify dozens of other addresses. And the same screening capabilities we showed before can be used to screen against those other addresses that are not just on the OFAC list, but are maybe used by those same sanctioned actors. And OFAC has been very clear that their list is not exhaustive. You, you need to uh, you know, avoid dealings with any list that you believe to be controlled by a sanctioned entity. Um, now, you know, I think to some degree, it's always going to be a case of catch up, you know, and we, we've seen this in other industries as well. You know, I think, for example, there are some analogies to, you know, when OFAC has sanctioned, uh, you know, ships and vessels belonging to countries like Iran and North Korea, they have frequently just changed flags or changed their location of registration. And it's been a very hard sometimes to, to keep up with that. So, you know, I do think we see some analogies there in the crypto space where, where criminals will, you know, the, the sanctioned actors will always try to, to find new addresses they can leverage. Um, but, you know, often what we do see is that even where they do that, um, they, they will tend to transact some over time with established addresses. So there, there are ways for us to, to um, you know, mitigate some of that challenge. Thanks, David. Um, there's another, I don't think we have time for too many more questions, but we will get back to you guys individually um, if we don't get to your question today. But there is one, um, is the VAST due diligence tool already available for usage? Yeah. Uh, Abby, do you so, want to keep going? Yeah, y yes, it is. Um, so if, if that's something that you're interested in, you can actually learn a little bit more about that um, on our website. We do have um, some information about the tool itself. And then obviously do reach out to us um, and we can sort of organize a demo uh, so you can see sort of its full capabilities. Thank you. And then I don't know how many more questions we have time for today, but um, just see if there's one more in here. Um, is it possible to buy um, vast diligence reports and ad hoc or um, as needed from Elliptic? Yes, yeah, so we have a professional services team. Um, and so they, uh, can do the sort of fast due diligence reports on a case by case basis. And um, so it would just be a case of once again, reaching out to us and um, us understanding kind of the, you know, what the sort of requirements and, and sort of the output that you are expecting and needed. Um, and then we can sort of talk uh, with, with your team and decide, you know, what would be the best fit in terms of uh, what we would provide. Thank you. Um, we are out of time today and I've seen a few people drop off. It might have something to do with the, uh, the euros on at the moment, but um, I just want to say thanks to David and Abby for a great session and thanks to everyone that joined us. It was really insightful. Um, we will be sending you the recording and anyone if we didn't get to your questions today, don't worry, we'll follow up with you personally. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, everyone.